Thank you. I'm Jerry Berrigan, uh, brother of Daniel and Philip Berrigan, who are defendants in the Plowshares 8 trial. My wife, daughter, and I have driven down from Syracuse, New York, which is our home, to attend the trial. And we arrived Sunday, were able to attend Monday and yesterday, and uh, so far today, and are leaving for, for home. What are your basic feelings about the action that your, your brothers took? Well, I'm wholly in accord with it, uh, with the action and with the defendants and, uh, and their philosophy and their beliefs and their convictions. Uh, just to inject myself for a moment, I, I have been arrested five times and I've spent some time in jail for s similar concerns and similar actions. So that... Could you, could you trace the, more or less the history of your own resistance action? Well, my resistance action, like that of my brothers, <clears throat> emerges from the uh, civil rights period of the 60s and even earlier. Uh, and then we kind of emerged from that when that began to die as the Vietnam War came on and concerned ourselves then with, with peace work and anti-war work. Uh, my brothers were able to be more active than I. I was home with four small children. My wife and I were home with four small children. <clears throat> but... Um, as our family has grown older and uh, my wife is now employed and I have more freedom, more opportunity to get in a, in a uh, direct resistance stance and that's what I'm intent on doing when I can. Do you have any particular hope for the outcome of this trial? Well, uh, I uh, tend to um, keep, some, keep my expectations high and my hopes low uh, because I, I distrust and dislike disappointment. I think that if the trial runs its course, uh, uh, according to the sentiment of the, of the judge and, and the prosecutor, then it can be expected that there will be a conviction. And uh, given a conviction on the counts being, for which the defense are being tried, then there will probably be a heavy jail sentence. Now, it's entirely possible that the uh, jury may reverse everyone's expectations and on the count of the moral issues that are going, that have been raised and are going to be raised increasingly in days to come, um, may refuse to convict the defendants and they may be set free. So uh, either, of course, is a, is a possibility. And I don't know where more weight lies, on which side. Why are the Berrigans so radical? I mean, how come they're so courageous? Well, um, my brothers especially are, are men who take the, uh, the, the gospel very seriously. Uh, that's not to say that they're literalists about gospel interpretation. They take it's the, the, the injunctions to love and to, to, to accept the, the brother and the, and the fellow human being and defend him and her, take it very seri seriously. And out of that seriousness emerges a lot of uh, conviction and, and, as you would say, a lot of courage. If you could uh, give one message to the people of America, what would that message be? The message would, would be that uh, the, the lesson contained in our founding documents, both the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, is that the people must uh, resist government when it becomes onerous and oppressive and, and evil. And uh, if the people of America uh, uh, love uh, freedom, and, and, and I don't know anyone who doesn't, then they had better be concerned about big government and begin, and begin getting into resistance, yeah, it's even civil resistance. That's my lesson to what, What's your personal feelings about the nuclear disarmament issue that seems to be the core of this, of this particular action that was taken? Oh, I, I think that uh, if the present course by the U, U.S. government and the Soviet governments and other governments, uh, if the present course is pursued, then uh, the terms that are used in the courtroom and have been used this morning, namely uh, genocide and uh, nuclear destruction of the human family and of the, and of the earth, is a certainty. So that um, unless some steps are taken by, hopefully by this government, uh, and soon to reverse the arms race and to stop the manufacture of, of nuclear arms, uh, the human race is doomed. I believe that very, very firmly. Do you see yourself and your brothers as being part of a uh, tradition of resistance that uh, dates back many years? And perhaps you could tell us about that tradition. 
<clears throat> well, the tradition uh, partakes of that mentioned by Bishop uh, Kenny uh, in his closing statement. He spoke of 2,000 years of tradition in the Catholic Church of resistance. Okay, And I, as a uh, Roman Catholic uh, in, in my tradition, uh, subscribe to that. Now, within the, the Berrigan family, there's a tradition of resistance going back to uh, uh, the, the, the youth of my father, who was a socialist and a member of the uh, International Workers of the World and uh, an early trade unionist and who lost uh, his job many times for his convictions and his activities and his memberships in such uh, organizations as those. Um, so that within our family there's, there's a, a kind of a mini tradition of, of resistance. What about in relationship to, uh, in a certain sense, sainthood, that some of the saints have been known to be uh, somewhat resistant? Oh, yes. Well, um, Dan is, is, doesn't hesitate to mention that St. Ignatius Loyola, who was the founder of the Jesuit order, of which he's a member, was an early resistor. Um, he uh, himself, Loyola, had been a soldier, uh, but uh, quickly discovered that the nonproductiveness and the inhumanity of that got out of it and eventually spent time in jail. And, uh, you know, this is uh, a common tradition among saints to, uh, to have been resistors of onerous and unjust civil authority and uh, to, to pay the, the price by getting behind bars. Yes, World War Two. So was I. Could, could you tell us a little bit about that? Or... Well, <clears throat> um, the fact that, that uh, Phil uh, enlisted in uh, 1943, and eventually when he uh, uh, arrived in Europe, uh, was assigned to Officer Candidate School in Paris, and finished there and, and was commissioned as second lieutenant uh, in the infantry. And uh, just about the time that... Um, how was it? I've forgotten the sequence. Uh, after the war in Europe ended, was sent back to the United States with the expectation of being sent to the uh, 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 Far East Theater to, uh, in the war against Japan. But about the, the time that he was ready to ship out, that war ended. So then he was decommissioned and discharged. And I, I just had a, a simple career as an enlistee in the Army and uh, spent three years overseas. And, uh, those were days of acceptance, okay? Those were days of non-questioning. Can you, can, you, can you point to any particular time when the days of non-questioning became days of questioning? Was there any particular transition moment? Not, not, not uh, a dramatic, uh, crisical moment, not in that sense. A gradual uh, recognition of uh, the basic rights of human beings through the... Uh, the uh, civil rights era of the uh, late 50s and, and, and 60s uh, in a sense that uh, because black people in the deep south especially in those days and whole people going there in their defense were commonly jailed for their resistance to unjust law then uh, perhaps this is the way uh, that human events have to work out in terms of human betterment and uh, so that it, you know it, it was a gradual uh, growing in consciousness and a gradual awareness that emerged through those activities and those concerns. You'd say actually that like the civil rights movement of the late 50s and the early 60s was somehow the, the gestation period for this. Yes, <clears throat> in, in, in uh, terms of our uh, recognizing that we had to uh, get personally involved and pay a personal risk for involvement uh, in behalf of our fellow human beings. You're very welcome. Lynn, lots of uh, good fortune with the rest of the film. Yeah.